Hey friends, we are so glad you're here today. We are coming to you live from Living Felt because it's Happy Wally Wednesday! And as a lot of our friends have shared with us, it is Fairy Day. National Fairy Day or International Fairy Day? We don't know, but we have started getting fairy messages and fairy love notes and we're just so grateful for you all. So thank you for joining us on National International. What is it? International. International Fairy Day. We are Living Felt. We are based right here in Central Texas and this is what we like to do on Wednesdays is hang out with our friends. If you've stumbled across this feed, this is our live show. So if you're watching live, join us in the chat and participate for today. We are going to be making our very own wet felted pre-felts. If you're watching the replay, well, heck, you can just hit that fast forward button and jump to any part of this you want to. But we do have some things to share with you before we get started with all of that. So we, we do want to say hi to a few people. Let's see who's here. So there's Melissa is in Wisconsin. Teresa is in the UK. I see Sally and Maryland and Susan in Pennsylvania. Oh, so nice to have you all here. Thank you for joining us today. So we're going to have a little wet felting tutorial live. We are going to, over the next few weeks, just break things down a little bit and move a little more slowly with wet felting because we want to help you build some basic skills skills that will help you advance what you're doing with your wet felted design but also with your wet felted pieces. So today is all about making our own pre-felts and we've decided that it's a great day to felt your blues away. So we're going to be looking at lots of blues today. I'm working with blues and the fairies are going to share some blues with you too. Um, so just before we do that, why don't I give away the prizes from last week. If you're brand new, say, um, hi, I'm new. If you've been around for a while, you'll see that all of our veterans are saying hi and where they're from. But beyond that, join us and participate in the conversation. We give away prizes at the end of the live show for everyone who has commented and shared with us while we're live. But we also give away prizes for people who comment after the live show and that will, after the show, you can comment down below. So the prizes for last week were uh, two types of pre-felt. We gave away our 19 and a half micron pre-felt and our 26 micron pre-felt so that you could experiment working with those. And our winners were pulled by the fairies. We have Sarah Powell and we have Tammy Sealing. So thank you so much for commenting on the video. If you've never ordered with us before, well then go to our website. Let me put that up real quick. Go to our website, scroll to the bottom and click contact us and say I'm a winner in the subject line and make sure we get all your information so we can send your goodies to you no matter where you are in the world. We will do that. So thank you all for joining us. Now the fairies, if you are very magical beings that make life here just so much more wonderful and the very first one is fairy hannah with an amazing show and tell so yay fairy yay, hannah hi everybody how are y'all doing today so i've got a fun little show and tell this is gonna be a baby mobile that i made for my good friend jamie and her new baby emery so congratulations, Jamie, Chris, and Jackson on the new baby, and I'm finally glad to be done. It took me probably like five months <laughs> to do this all, so I just wanted to bring that in and show some of y'all what I've been spending my time creating. Oh, man. It's so cool, Hannah. Thank you. I'm really, really proud of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Indeed. And now look at, show them the, the little hedgy in there. This one is Marie's favorite. It's uh -huh. a little hedgehog holding a heart with a little butterfly on it. Oh, man. Everybody loves it so Thank you. much, Hannah. Thank you. I'm so excited to show y'all. Oh. So Lou says, amazing mobile. Patricia says, love the mobile. So colorful. So yeah. cute. Thank beautiful, you, y'all. Thank y'all oh. so much. And I'll post some pictures on the Facebook group, uh, hopefully tonight, mm -hmm. for y'all to see some close-ups. Oh, so cool. Yay! Thank you so much, y'all. Thank you very much. And next up, I got Miss Fairy Lauren. Yay! <laughs> oh, 
Hi, y'all. Happy Wooly Wednesday. So last week on our show, we showed you guys our uh, pre-felt and natural white. And this week, we wanted to show you our 100% merino 19.5 uh, micron pre-felt in our dyed colors. And this pre-felt is very thin, and it is ideal for wet felting, especially for inclusion or for any thin base. Now, this is our blues collection. It's probably my favorite because blues is my favorite color. Um, so I'll walk you through these beautiful colors. So this is deep teal, this is royal blue, this is bright blue, and this is turquoise. Now we wanted to show you these side by side so you could appreciate the value and also see how vibrant and beautiful they are. And again, this is our blues collection and I hope showing this really blew you away. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. And up next we have the fabulous Mary Becca. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Hi guys, Barry Becca here. So today I wanted to show you our MC1 Blues Studio Pack. So MC1, of course, is a great fiber to felt with. It's a short, crimpy, medium fine fiber with about a 25 micron count. So in our studio packs, you get six colors each and they vary round to round depending on what we pull for. So today I wanted to show you what we have in our current round. So we have some nice beautiful blues here. We have Chicory, Blue Azul, Robin's Egg, Indigo, Blue Frost, and Caspian. And each one comes with a handy dandy color list for you. And I love this pack so much, I think it's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and <laughs> up next is Fairy Holly. <laughs> Hi, so <laughs> over the last few months, I've had to adopt a new attitude of going with the flow. So I am here to show you our Merino Top Studio Pack that is going with the flow. Merino Top is a smoother fiber with a 19 and a half uh, micron count and it's great for wet felting. You can also use it for needle felting but wet felting is great and Marie's gonna be working with this a little bit. So let's talk about the colors. These are great colors for skies and oceans um, or pretty much anything you want but this, these are the colors that are included in our current pack. We have Midnight, Glacier, Lagoon, Cornflower, Evening, and Horizon. So that's our studio pack, and it's a great way to get, well, I was going to say get rid of the blues, but you kind of want the blues, I guess, if you're getting the pack. <laughs> <laughs> and next we have Fairy Anne. Yay! Uh, hi, friends. This is one of our specialty designer packs. They have fine merino top, MC1 batting, merino silk blends, plus tons of fun embellishment fibers. These specialty designer packs are perfect for creating texture in your wet felting projects. Since we're sharing some blues today, I especially wanted to share this Blue Delight pack with you. We're gonna go through the colors so you can see all the deliciousness that comes in here. We have got merino top in Midnight, Tide Pool, Hydrangea, Cornflower, and Bay. We've got our MC1 batting in Blue Frost, Majestic Blue, and Caspian. We've got Merino Silk Blend in Damson and Atlantis. We've got some fun 19 and a half micron pre-felt in Bright Blue for you to play with. Bamboo Top in Oasis. Sorry Silk Waist in Cornflower. Evening Wool Neps. Glacier Silk Hankies, Lagoon Tessa Silk, and some fun hand-dyed locks that were actually dyed by Fairy Kayla. So, Yay! round of applause on that. <laughs> and we also wanted to take a moment to say a big thank you to Kevin in North Austin. Thank you, Kevin! <laughs> we appreciate he sent us some cookies today. <laughs> he had them delivered, and we're just we're so grateful and so humbled that um, y'all take all the time out of your day to share your good thoughts and good wishes and, and do these things for us. It really does just 
bless our day and brighten our day. And Kevin, we're grateful for you. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, Fairy Kayla. Alrighty. Hey everyone, Fairy Kayla, how you doing? <laughs> kind of doing a Hannah thing today. <laughs> So I know Anne just showed off. <laughs> Anne just showed off the specialty designer pack, and I'm showing off the specialty designer bundle. I <laughs> mix those two up. I'm sorry. So it's just got a little more fiber, and you get bigger amounts of luster fiber. And who doesn't want any of that? Who who doesn't not want that? I'm sorry. <laughs> I promise I work here. <laughs> I'm going to show these off for you guys and, and go through them with you. Now this is our 19 and a half micron merino top. You'll get hydrangea, teal, midnight, cornflower, and glacier, as well as two ounces of the silk blends in Atlantis and Ocean, and those will be one of each. And then for the luster fibers, we've got glacier hankies, royal blue tussa silk, lagoon nips, evening nips, cornflower, corn sorry, silk, <laughs> rapids bamboo top, and our wonderful wisteria in Angelina. Yeah, and that there is the specialty designer bundle beautiful blues. So now I've got a question for you. <laughs> Why is the ocean blue? Why is the ocean blue? Because the shore never waves back. <laughs> All right, and I'll turn it back over to Miss Marie. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I just hope you just send a big round of hearts for those amazing fairies. Uh, just, I really love that they get to come on and share with you. And so many of you want to see our products. Uh, uh, you get a little opportunity to see them live on the show. So we're trying to get better at previewing and sharing with you a little bit about what we're going to be working with today, even though we'll be working with much smaller amounts. And our goal is to get some of those on the website under the product. So when you're shopping, then you can click on a little video and see those. So we are working on that. And thank you all so much for your love and your kindness. So today we are making um, pre-felts. And these pre-felts we're going to be working into a more complex project a little later on. And I'll show you a couple of different projects um, when we get to that point of what we can make with them. But the most important thing, uh, I think, is to really learn how to make a good felt. And in this case, we're going to work with pre-felts. So as the gals showed you, you can buy plain uh, pre-felts from us. So the 19 micron pre-felt comes in a range of dyed colors and they're all solids. But it can be really fun to make your own pre-felts for inclusions. And um, pre-felts, though, beyond what we're doing today, can have a variety of uses. And in this case, we're going to be designing for surface design. That's our goal today, designing for surface design. So we're going to be wet felting. And if you're going to be wet felting with me today, let me uh, let us, if you're in the live, just give us a little chat and say, yeah, that you're felting along. What do we got so far, Anne, to kick us off? Anything we should note? Alex says... So glad I got here just in time to see the joke. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay, so we are going to be wet felting for surface design. And I brought in a couple of examples for you. Now, after the show, you're going to be able to download. Uh, I haven't got it up on the website yet, but you're going to be able to download my little notes card to store with your pre-felts. Uh, if you decide to store them away for another day. Now let me just show you these couple of little things. And these are just a, a few simple little examples here. So this is a nano felt pre-felt. So I've used the fine merino top. It's just a couple of layers of merino top with a silk fabric inclusion. And we'll do one of those today. And this is the little note card that I have. So the note card basically outlines what type of fiber or fabrics did I use? How many layers of fiber did I use? How many rolls did I do? And we'll talk about why that's important. What are the overall dimensions? 
uh, what is the weight, what was the layout style I used. And then this one is uh, one color merino top on the bottom. I mean, yes, I wanted it to be darker. And then I chose lighter on top so that if there's migration, this dark underneath might come up through once we felt it down all the way. We call that a halo and I would like, I left this area here as an example really sparse because I wanted it to not be very solid. As we felt this down these will migrate more but like here I wanted to see the striations and here I wanted to see them too. So this was intentional whereas this one is done just a little more solid. So this is what we're going to be making today, our pre-felts that you can store away for another day. So the reason for the note cards are so that if you like its performance in your project, then you know that your approach was the right one. If, for example, you take this approach and this one was rolled it was first rolled a hundred times from all four edges and then 60 times from all four edges just because I like to count in 20s really I could have gone 50 or whatever um, so it's a very lightly felted partially felted but very lightly partially felted pre felt if you cut this out and use it in the surface design of another project and you wish the lines were crisper then you know that you would need to felt it a little bit more in the pre-felt stage. For me, the way I use it in surface design is a little more abstract and I'm not a very geometric person, but if you are, then these notes are going to be really important for you to keep in mind how far did you go and do you want to go further. And the size would allow you to store this away in a bag or some kind of clear envelope and know what you have to work with as you click through your pre-felt sample. So you might store these away for another day. So before we get started, are there any questions I should answer? Stacy asks, are those pre-felts fully felted? These, so a pre-felt is never fully felted. So by definition of a pre-felt, it's only partially felted. So a pre-felt is only partially felted. And we actually went over lots of different types of fibers for felting on last week's show. And we talked a lot about pre-felts. So since it was of such interest to people, um, I did take that as the go ahead that it would be a good idea for us to just make some of our own so you have them. So no, these are not fully felted. They still have feltability in my world, that's my word, feltability, and that means we can include them in the surface design of another project, and that's what we'd be doing later. We'll be, I'll be cutting these into pieces and using them in another project. Okay, any other questions? Nope. And so we're ready to go. Okay, so we're going to felt, and I'm going to set up my table here so that we can make pre-felts together. So I mentioned um, in the Facebook group, and if y'all don't belong to our Facebook group, let me just put it up on the screen here. This is where we hang out all week in our Facebook group. Oops, sorry for that. And um, this is where we share lots of things, but in the Facebook group, I posted how to get ready for today's show if you wanted to felt along with me. So I am just going to drop things down here and we're gonna set up our table. So I called it a half table setup. And the first thing I do is I pull out my grippy mat. Now I just keep all my grippy mats rolled up and after they're dried, I just store them in like a big five gallon paint bucket along with my rolling tools in my wet felting closet. But what I have in my, this is what I do both in my home studio and here, is I keep these little gallon Ziploc bags uh, full of just the basic things I like to work with when I am wet felting. So this is a half table setup and this is always what's in the bag. You can have more supplies but this is what's in here. So the first thing is two sheets of our very thin plastic. Uh, bubble wrap and at least one piece of mesh. You might like to have two. Some of my bags have two. That's what goes in here and this allows me not to dig through my supplies to try and find what I'm looking for. I can just grab this and then also store it away easily. I got tired of always digging through my stuff. So you'll want to grab your half table setup. On top of my groupie mat I put a base towel and this towel pretty much always stays down on the surface and then the next thing goes our bubble wrap. On top of the bubble wrap I put my plastic that I just fling it across the room. 
Did I fling it? Oh, it's right here. <laughs> it's tucked under my towel. Sorry, y'all. I'm going to put um, my first sheet of plastic. Actually, I'm lying. Let me start over. My, I put my plastic underneath my bubble wrap to start. So, I'm really excited for these note cards. Angela says these are going to be such a blessing. Oh, good. Yeah, use the note cards. Right. So here's what I did. My plastic and then my, I mean, my bubble wrap and then my plastic. And then we're going to lay out our project right on here. I meant to bring a cheater for you guys. Let me see if I have a piece of paper in here. One of the things I like to do, I'll just use this as an example. Let me um, show you. Sometimes when you're laying stuff out, you don't know how big you want to lay things out. I will take either a note card, a pre-cut resist, or even a piece of felt that's colored, and I'll put it underneath so that I have a guide of where I want to lay fibers out. It's just an idea if you're going to be laying bare fiber down. If you want to control the size, rather than measure or draw, you can give yourself a little template to lay out on. Yeah, anyway, that's, that's one of my little cheaters, is put something under your piece so that you know what size to lay things out. Now these I'm not going to measure too much, but let's look at the basic uh, wet felting supplies that you need just to get started, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, and it let's ask any questions you have now while we're, while we're in this stage. So can you see, yeah, I think you can see all the, all the supplies pretty well. And I am going to be working with just regular room temperature water. It doesn't need to be hot. We're not trying to felt these fast or aggressively. What we are trying to do is just to get everything to hold together. For me, I am doing lightly felted pre-felts. I like a watering tool. You can use a ball brush or a sponge. I'll probably use both. Our olive oil soap or whatever soap you like to felt with, we stand by our olive oil soap. I use it all the time. Either an extra towel for rolling or a rolling cloth. Sometimes I'll just use a quilt square if it's very small or you can use a towel, whatever you prefer. Um, this tray is nothing <laughs> other than my organizing tray. And um, I also like to use a rolling apparatus. So these are the dowels we have here at the shop. This is what I use at home. It's just a closet pole from the hardware store that's been cut. I like the weight and I like the size. So whatever you have. The projects I'm doing today are very small, meaning they're not large in dimension. So I won't use a pool noodle because I don't need it to be so big. But if you're doing like a whole half table or a whole table and you're going to be rolling a bunch of stuff up, this girth can help it not buckle on itself so much. But since our projects today are very tiny, one of these will work fine. And if you want to break it down even smaller, you could use a bamboo mat. I just want to encourage you not to be overly aggressive because we're working with fine fibers and fabrics. There's no reason to really get these things grinding against. We just want to use it you know, as an agitator tool. So any of these things will work for today and I'm going to work with my beloved closet pole and this little setup that I have right here. Okay and y'all just interrupt me with questions and Anne's going to feed me your questions as we go. Maureen asks what size should the plastic wrap and bubble wrap be for this? Oh Maureen asks what size should these things be. So today I'm just calling for a half table setup. So like I said you could do a pre-felt you know, this big. You could do it on the bamboo mat and do something very small. You could do a boot tray size. I just think of things as in the size of my layout. So um, in this case, I'm still going to be making small pieces, but I want a bigger area to work. So you could go as small as this, fits on the bamboo mat, bam uh, boot tray, half table, whole table. Shoot, you could do double table if you want, but that's how I kind of speak of layout sizes. Bamboo mat, boot tray, half table, full table, double table. Just, so just you come up with what those dimensions are for you. Cool? Devin asks, why plastic on top of the bubble wrap? Oh, because that way you can sandwich it in the, the plastic. You could do it either way. You could have the plastic underneath or the plastic on the outside, but it also allows you to get rid of one or the other. So this is just a nice flipping tool. and. 
if if I were doing something small where the plastic was just bigger than my piece, you can also use the plastic to help you fold and get nice crisp edges. I'm not even going to worry about that uh, today. I'm not. I'm not going to worry about that. We're just going to go through the basics of how to make your own pre-felt. I'm working with blues because that's going to be the project that I'm working on. And so let me talk you through um, just this basic process. And yeah, let's just do it. So I'm working with 19 micron merino top as my primary fiber. I like to split the width so that it gets nice and narrow. I'm just going to tear a piece off to start. Um, I like to split the width so it gets nice and narrow and is easy to handle. And what we want to do are two layers of merino. And those can be anything you want. There are no rules with that. But I'm going to split the width and then we're going to lay out a little square. So just for fun, what did I do with that cod? Let's use this piece of paper. I'm going to lay out sort of as if I'm going over a piece of paper. So this is going to be the size of what I'll lay out here on this one. Give yourself some room from the perimeter. Don't go all the way to the edge of your plastic. Make your fiber nice and straight and I'm just going to do a crisscross layout and I'm going to mix it up within this too but we want to have your wool flat and straight and this is how I pull it off just like that so I have a nice little wispy edge and this I think you'll find that you really like this little guide and you want your pieces to be thin enough so that you can still kind of see the color underneath and notice that I'm overlaying about a third and then I'm going to come down this way I will put in a different color over here this is all subjective at this point but I want to encourage you to make nice thin layers of fiber, practice pulling off your wool so that it is even and lightweight. Now, notice that it's trailing off here and not quite filled in, so I'll show you how to do that. Claire asks, why use plastic and not mesh for this project? I'm going to use mesh on the top, Claire, so thank you for asking that. I'm going to use both mesh and plastic in my example here with you. So I will show you now. Um, I will show you that when we get to that wedding out part, and we'll talk about that. Okay. So let's now. What I like to do is where this is this way is flip the wool backwards. Notice when you pull off, wherever you pull off, that this end right here is always rounded or a little more fanned out, and this end is always a little more blunt. And so when I get right to the end, I like to flip it backwards. Sometimes when you see me do a project, you'll see me trim the edges of something in a you know horizontal or parallel with the edge. But in this case, I'm not really worried about the edges um, being that uniform. So I have one layer going up and down. I want the next layer to go across. And I'm going to go ahead and just do, um, I will do the same color and then I'm going to put some embellishments on top and then I'll fill in this area right here with another color. Melissa asks, can MC1 be pre-felted? Yes, so Melissa asks, can you pre-felt MC1? And my answer is that you can pre-felt anything. You can pre-felt MC1, you can pre-felt New Zealand Coriadel, you can pre-felt anything that you would normally felt with. You absolutely can. And last week we even showed a needle felt pre-felt in MC1 that we later wet felted. So yes, whatever fibers you have, you can make a pre-felt with. Just keep in mind when you go to felt them into some other project, if you pre-felt MC1 or if you pre-felt merino top and then you want it to bind with a coarser fiber, um, you want to make some samples so that you know how far to take this and how much effort it's going to take to get those to felt together. So always samples are going to be your friend. Sample, sample, sample. And that's what we're doing today, let's say. A sample is a sample until you you know, know that it's right just how you want it. So now we do have 100% coverage there and I'm gonna lay out another area over here. I'm laying all this out for another project I'm going to be doing and I'm just gonna go light on this side. Angie asks, 
Do you have any tips for not making the wool stick to my hands when doing layouts? Oh, so Angie asked how to get the wool not to stick to her hands during layout. And Angie, I hope you can answer this question in time, but are your hands damp? Like my hands are dry right now, so I'm not having any problem with it sticking to my hands. Is it sticking to your hands because the wool is wet or is it sticking to your hands because your hands are rough? If your hands are rough, you might just try putting lotion on your hands to start um, and see if that helps you. So that would be the one thing. If your hands are dry, there really shouldn't be a problem with that. Um, but let us know, Angie, what do you, what do you think is happening there? So notice there's real, no different ch uh, change here. All we're making, y'all, is something that we can cut, for me, cut into a shape and felt into another project. When we make these pre-felts, this is going to give us an opportunity to really control that shape when it goes on to the next project. Now, so here I have one layer going up and down and we want the next one to go across. And did Angie respond? Not yet. Okay. We'll watch for your feedback, Angie. To see what, what you think might be happening. Okay. Linda, Linda asks, can you, can you combine MC1 and Merino top in the same pre-felt? You can, you could, but here's what I'll say is, so you can, you can wet felt MC1 and Merino top together. You absolutely can. The Merino top is going to want to felt faster than the MC1. So take it slowly and keep in mind that when you make that pre-felt, you're only trying to get them to hold together enough to be cut until you run some tests, um, you know, to see how far can you take it to get the shapes and the line sort of crispness that you're wanting. So it really is going to come down to making a test. Okay, so here I have put together um, only merino top, but you can include other things in your pre-felt too. You can include something like, I'll bring in some um, bamboo fiber, and I'm sorry I'm not very centered, I know I got, I got room to go up here probably annoying to watch <laughs> how, how I'm not centered on the camera. There we go. It's probably a little better. What else? Any other questions right now? Yes. Stormy asks, is it true that pre felts don't really shrink as much? Stormy, I I would say that you what you have to understand is you're getting it's if you're talking about the shrinkage in the pre felt stage, true because you're not fulling it and you're not felting it down all that much. So when you make a pre-felt, you're kind of just getting the fibers to bind together and you're not getting them to really, really migrate together. But then when you incorporate them into your other piece, they're still going to have plenty of shrinkage left in them. So just expect that. I'm gonna put, just for fun so you can see the difference, I'm gonna put some of this bamboo on top of the light and then some on top of the blue. In fact, I'm just gonna cover this transition right here. And I'm just winging it, y'all. When it comes to design, very often I'm, I pick a theme, I pick a color and texture palette, and that's about as far as I go. I usually just pick a color theme and then build a color and texture palette. So this is just how Marie plays, and you might be a lot more um, well thought out than I am in your design, but like I said, I'm not very geometric. And I'm mixing these fibers up because I just want them to give me a nice sheen and no really particular grain. Um, but you can also use fabrics in your pre-felt, and I did bring some. I have another bucket. Oh, here's my fabrics. Okay, I brought in some fabrics. Now, you see me use this one a lot. I've gotten so much mileage out of this, this tunic. I got this tunic many years ago, and it has become, I wore it for a long while, and now it's become many felted things. Um, so you might think, why not just put this triangle of fabric into your felted piece, and you can do that, but you could also put a square down and then cut out a perfect triangle of just the spot you want. This is going to help control your shape just a little bit better by putting it into making a pre-felt with it um, before you actually felt it. And that's just something to think about. You might do that. 
and I'm going to put down a little bit of this merino silk blend. It's variegated and since I already have all these layers going down here, I can just take advantage of these beautiful striations just as they are in this fiber and I think I'm just going to put them right here in the middle. I know what will happen is I'll end up not wanting to cut this fabric, which is usually <laughs> what happens to me. I don't, wanna, I don't want to cut it up. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and just blend it all the way up here so it feels like I have not just this weird little open area, but a big, so I have a big design theme here I can take from. I have something here, something here, and all of these. Now, it would be hard to get all of these into another piece without really um, seeing all those wispy ends, but by felting them together, we'll be able to get that. I thought I brought one more bling fiber. What do I have? Hmm. So I've used some, uh, I know I have silk. Oh, here's some Tessa silk. So I have bamboo, merino silk blend, silk fabric, merino top, and let's just go ahead and put in some Tessa silk. Tessa silk, viscose, bamboo. You can treat them all the same, but notice how you like them. We'll do another one where we only work with these guys. But I'm just gonna put some of this in for sheen, and I will put it right here. Susan asks, does the fabric need to be silk or could it be cotton? Cotton, Susan asks, can she use cotton fabric in her nano felt? And I would say, I mean, in her pre-felts, I would say to test. I have uh, felted with cotton and I've received items felted with cotton and cotton is gonna be different depending on the weave. So really, I would say to test that yourself because cotton is going to be normally more resistant unless it's more of an open weave. So I would encourage you to play with that a little bit. Okay, so here we are. We have our little piece all laid out, and we're just going to make this little small piece. When it comes to making your pre-felts, you might want to think you can make several of them, or you could just make one or two at a time. I'm going to drop in, this is some of the commercial pre-felt, just into my felting space. You might make pre-felts in tandem while you're felting something else and just kind of cue those up, or you might just spend a day making some pre-felts and um, playing with that. When you want your lines to be really fine and sharp, you might want to felt your pre-felts a little more. These are the commercial pre-felts that we shared with you last week. These are just the dyed versions that Lauren showed you before the show started. And these will kind of fuzz out a little bit along the edges as they are now. So what you can do is felt them a little bit more and then cut them and put them into your pre-felts and see how you like them. Now, before I jump to that and we're going to wet felt this piece, I did bring a piece, I'll show you real fast, I'll just hold it up. Um, this piece I used some pre-felts in and I meant to show you before the show, but like right up here are three stacked pre-felts that were just cut, they weren't felted any further, and they were just laid right into this piece. And the way they all merge together, there's not a lot of fuzzing out of the lines, and I was pretty happy with that. Right here, these are pre-felt black lines also, which would be a little more challenging to get if you were just laying down sliver or top. Um, so this is one of the fun ways to work with it, but if you're wanting your lines even sharper than this, then in working with these, you might want to felt them just a little bit further. So I'm going to go ahead and drop one of these into our felting project today so that when we do our bigger project, we can gauge adding this in unfelt, you know, not felted any further and then felted a little bit more. Why not? Cool. Anne's giving me the thumbs up. Okay, I'm just going to drop it. I'm going to drop it right here and let it migrate with my others so that we can, I'll just go ahead and do them both. I'll let them migrate, just migrate with my others, and either they'll bind or they won't. I'm not really worried about that. I just want to kind of get them all in one pass and not have a bunch of edges to manage. That's my goal, really. Okay, so once you have your fiber laid out, and I'm not going to put any top dressing on those guys, but you could um, use that in your sample if you want as well, we want to wet this all out. And this is where I bring in my mesh. So I like to wet through the mesh because then I can really feel how much soap and water I'm putting on my project. And this is how I like to do it. 
myself. I have no soap in my water. Sometimes I, I will just swish my soap in my water. But I get my sponge just fully loaded with water and I'm going to rub it on my soap so that basically I'm loading up my soap onto the sponge. And then I'll press all the way through my project. And I'm pressing water and air in. I know someone else can finish that sentence for me. <laughs> I mean, I'm pressing water and soap in and what out? Someone's gonna finish that sentence and I've got a $10 gift certificate for you. I'm pressing water and soap in Anne's going to wait for the first one. <laughs> the first person to get it. If you felt it with me before, you know how to finish that sentence. Well, we, oh, Daniela Kretschmer. <laughs> All right. She, she said an air out. Is that right? She did. Congratulations, Daniela. You won a $10 gift certificate. Yay. <laughs> okay, so we are pressing water and soap in and air out and that's why I like to use the sponge really it helps me not put too much water in and it really helps me control where the water goes I, I just like it. it I learned I learned how to do this by error so the very first wet felting instructions I had were on paper and I think the person said to have the sponge to clean up excess water <laughs> I swear <laughs> And I thought it was to put the water and soap in, and that's what I've been doing for oh, about 20 years. <laughs> and I like it. Okay, so notice now, after you wet out your project, you're wetting it from the inside to all the way to the edges, you want to gently press. Notice I'm not rubbing. You just want to gently press so that everything is well wetted, and it also allows you, what happens is you push some of the water to back to the perimeter. This is a really shallow project, so not a lot of fiber. If it was very thick, what you would feel as you pressed or pressed out here is some of the water runs in and out and in and out. So really what you want is a uniform wetness and you don't want it sitting in puddles of water. If water is starting to stream to your perimeter, then by all means go ahead and pick that up because as soon as you start to roll it's going to squish out anyway. You can lightly rub with your hands, but for a project like this, what I don't want you to do is um, be overly aggressive. Uh, often I will rub lightly with my hands across the entire project like this just to form a surface skin. So you're only sort of commingling those very top fibers on the surface and you're not trying to go below the surface. So let me show you that here gently, evenly, methodically, and with a touch as light as putting lotion on a baby's back. So notice that I'm not swishing all over the place, I'm not jumping from here to here, it's really methodical, and then you can go this direction. So we're only entangling those surface fibers. Now, once that is fully wet and soaked, then we're going to remove our mesh and remember to peel back your mesh at a very shallow angle. Notice this stuff is already just grabbing onto it. That's okay. It's going to, um, it might grab onto it, especially where you have uh, fine fibers, but just use your hands to hold all those fibers down. I swear I was barely touching this stuff. <laughs> okay, just peel back at a very shallow angle and make sure nothing is sticking. I usually don't feel it sitting down too. Is there a maximum number of layers that you can include in a pre-felt? I would say to test for sure. You know, test and find what you're doing. So there aren't rules for stuff like this. You're going to want it to support your project, um, but you're really going to want to test it for what your particular outcome is. That's absolutely, you know, that's what tests are all about. No two projects are exactly the same. All right, so now we have this down and you don't want to rub on top of the plastic without getting it wet and a little soapy that's going to allow your hands to glide across so if you feel like you're heavy-handed see how my hand grabbed onto the plastic so you don't just want water you want soap too so if you feel like you're heavy-handed the plastic might be more your friend and then you can do that surface rubbing that I was doing over the top but make sure that you're not scooting these fibers around underneath. Okay. Um, 
Linda shares, I really appreciate this instruction. It is very helpful today. Oh, good. Yeah, this is just all about, honestly, t slowing it down, taking really tiny little baby steps, but also just going through this effort, this little, um, this little stage, you're going to have something to work with that you cannot buy off the shelf. So whether you're bringing in your own fabrics or not, you just can't get this stuff anywhere else. Um, okay, so I'm going to wrap this up, but what I failed to do was put down my rolling towel. So let me show you that. This is my rolling towel, and I like a towel to go across and hold my whole project. So I'm going to get that under here and roll this up so that it's round, um, but don't squeeze it. Don't bind it too hard. Rose says, I owe my kids a thousand apologies. After starting memo felting, I understand how light I should have, should have been putting lotion on Oh! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we go. We're rolling up our package. Depending on how big your piece is, these little end wings on your towel can help you keep the water from flying off to everywhere the water could possibly fly. And we're just going to do a hundred rolls from each side. So this is kind of boring to watch me roll. So it's a good time to ask your questions. And I'm going to do my best to count. I should pay someone to count. <laughs> I'm going to roll basically in rounds of 20. And you want to, after each 20, just give your project a quarter turn so that a different spot is laying on the table at each point. And I move my hands to kind of cover the whole width. This isn't very big, but you know, start my hands in the middle and then move them to the outside by the time I get to the end of a count. So let me just count this one off for you and it'll be the only one we count. Here we go. So this is the last round. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Like that. that's how I move my hands. Now it's gonna get if it when we first roll it, it's just a little bit loose. So each time you roll it, you'll get a little bit tighter. But keep in mind, we're just making a pre-felt. I'm not pressing all that hard. My goal really is just, just enough for this stuff to hold together. You could pick a pre-felt apart if you wanted to. Stephanie asks, could you stick with the mesh instead of switching to the plastic? Uh, Stephanie, you could stick with the mesh, but just make sure if you use the mesh, and I used the mesh for years with no plastic over top, using the, the plastic is honestly a little more recent for me to use um, a double layer of plastic. But if you use the mesh, um, definitely make sure that you peel it back each time you stop rolling to make sure it's not sticking. And peeling it back is going to discourage it from sticking to the mesh and cause it to felt more with the layers underneath. I like uh, felting with the mesh. Sometimes I feel like the plastic um, kind of inhibits the felting a little bit until you get to a certain stage. Like you'll notice that when we are felting, we take the plastic off. If you leave the plastic on for too long, sometimes I feel like it's honestly a little more resistant. So you'll see that we take it off in the felting process. And um, even the same with the mesh, we take it off after a while. So in the beginning, the mesh is just a barrier between your hands and the wet fiber. And that's all the plastic is too. So here we go again. So any questions? Norma asks, if I were, after I remove the mesh, I see any empty spaces, can I add more fibers at this point? That's a great question. So if you check your piece and you're not happy with the thickness, yes, it's a great time to add to it. Now, I am a very big proponent. If you watch any of my wet felting videos, besides this one when I didn't mention it, um, is that you really want to get it even in the layout. So do your best in the layout process to not have those holes. That's part of when I pat the fiber when it's dry is I'm feeling for that evenness. But it also speaks to, it's a great sort of exercise in mindfulness, the layout. If you really pay attention to each little spot you're on, um, then you're gonna get better and better at laying out evenly to start. Couple of our building friends want to know how to clean the mesh. Oh, for the mesh, just let it dry. Just completely let it dry all the way next day and just pick the fibers off before you start the next time. So if you're being light-handed and not overly aggressive with the mesh, you're not going to have too much stick. Um, some people who don't like the mesh are a bit more, you know, heavy-handed 
and they find a lot of their fiber is binding to the mesh. So notice um, what I'm doing here. I'm just giving the whole project a quarter turn each time I unroll. Oh, I meant to. That's not what I meant to do. I'm all distracted talking to you guys today. I meant to roll 100 times from each, but I've only been running 20 times from each. Well, after this, we'll roll 100 <laughs> times from each. So, so much for Marie's big free felt lesson. I wanted to roll 100 times from each edge, and I've only been rolling 20 times from each edge because I'm just not paying attention. <laughs> so uh, we're going to do this um, 20 from each edge, and then we'll go back and do 100 from each edge. That's and funny. Can you ask, can you use a palm wash cord or other folding tool, or is it going to be too heavy for making free felt? If you use a palm washboard, I would just say to really be very gentle. Don't use any pressure. Be very even and very methodical about it. Um, and, you know, test your results. Learning to felt is a lot like learning, learning to wet felt especially, is a lot like learning to bake. And it's a lot about learning to um, know what things should feel like. So your pre-felts, you need them to perform well when you incorporate them into the next project. So it's really important that you pay attention to what you're doing, like rolling 20 times or 100 times. <laughs> Pay attention to what you're doing and then evaluate those results after. And that's what the note cards are for as well. So that will give you a little better idea. Devin asks, do you have any tips for getting the silk fabric to incorporate? I'm having issues with attaching. Okay, sure. So let's, after we're, we're rolling just uh, 20 times from each side, uh, and again, I would do it 100, let's go ahead and answer, De was it Devin? Devin, hi Devin. Let's answer Devin's question about if you're having a difficult time for your stuff to incorporate. First of all, the first thing I'm going to encourage is that you use room temperature water and that is because you want to slow down the felting process. If you use too hot of water or you're overly aggressive, the fibers are going to want to bind to themselves instead of the fabric. And so um, that's why you want to slow down the temperature and the pressure. But here's something else you can do. Um, so let me give you a little look here at, at what things look like right now. And this is kind of the view where we first started. So you can tell that I've gone all the way around. I'm going to look at our piece. Now if your silk fabric is on top, and it may not always be in your layout, sometimes it might be underneath, but if you're having a difficult time with things, the fiber migrating through, and I would say after you've rolled more than we've already rolled, what you can do is just rub from this side and think of kind of coaxing those fibers up from the bottom by rubbing on the silk side. So here, you're kind of encouraging the fibers to come up through the other side. But also just be patient, like see how everything is kind of starting to come together, but um, we don't want to stop now. We want to keep rolling. So I'm going to say that we want to roll this piece at least 100, uh, I'm going to do a total of 150 times from each side. So we've had our big 20. Woohoo, that's funny. <laughs> we've had our big 20. We've checked our stuff. We like the evenness. You could add anything right now if you wanted to. But if you're happy with that, then let's go back to rolling it up. And notice how much easier it is to roll up. Something else that I like about pre-felts is like if you're feeling not all that creative or maybe not, I know a lot of people at least right now have kind of, my friends have said that they're kind of in a creative block or a little bit of a funk zone, they've lost their, their mojo. This is a good thing that you can kind of make and queue up. Pick your favorite colors. You know what your favorite colors are. Pick your favorite colors and make some pre-felts of your favorite colors. Think about uh, making some pre-felts as a stash buster so that you kind of have these things ready to go for another project. And if it comes that you decide not to use them in the pre-felt stage, well, you could felt them all the way at a later date and then make them into something else, even if that's a sew-in project or a hand-stitch project. So there's no harm in making these pre-felts in advance. Michelle asks, so you didn't worry about getting a surface skin on the project before rolling? Uh, nah. I mean, one, this is so little. Two, I just made sure the fibers were kind of, I wanted them kind of coaxing together enough 
that they weren't going to just stick right away to my plastic. But even the rolling alone is fine. So that was Michelle asked about not forming the surface skin. So a little thing about wet felting. Here's the truth. You could wet felt something 100% just by hand rubbing. Just doing this stuff. You could wet felt something 100% just by rolling. Despite some teachers saying, don't roll until, especially when you think of a thin project like this, it's a little different than a project that's this thick. But I have wet felted uh, a project that was this thick to start only with hand rubbing up until the last 20 minutes of two, three days of, of rubbing. So there's not one way to felt and you can roll 100%. 100%. Janine asks, so is the purpose of the pre-felt so that you can do more wet felting or needle felting on it at a later time? Uh, you could do either. So who is that, Janine? Janine, good question. So Janine asks, is, is making the pre-felt for wet felting or needle felting? Well, you can do either. But in this case, I am light, you know, felting these uh, so much, but I'm designing them for a wet felting project myself. And I would say just test the doneness of your pre-felt. Um, usually when I'm needle felting, when I make a pre-felt for needle felting, I often like to take it a little bit further, more to the soft felt stage. So, I mean, just a pinch more so that the part I'm needle felting in stays in, but the part that's not being needle felted still has enough integrity that it's not going to just blow away, you know, on the air. So you can do both. Maybe a little more challenging to needle felt the silk fabric, you know, um, that would be a little more challenging to needle felt through because you would poke it and potentially put runs in it. So think about that placement, you know, as you're making the pre-felts. Even silk, the silk fibers, the tussis silk, the viscose and stuff, they just are a little more challenged to needle felt. So I would encourage making yourself some samples before you actually, you know, plan a whole big project. Just make some test pieces. If you plan to make something this big, well, make a little tiny one and make some little pre-felt samples so that you can test it. Mm -hmm. But I do have a, I'll show you right after we get done with our rolling, then I will show you something that I pre-felted to needle felt. I brought something with me to share with you. It's completely different than this, but still relevant, I think. Okay. Some of our felting friends want to know if you have to use a towel when you roll, and uh, do you have any tips for keeping the towel from flopping around? And getting oh yeah, I know, that's annoying, isn't it? Okay, so do you have to use a towel? No, but the towel keeps your hands from sliding all over the wet plastic. And um, you could also, I've wet felted, in, instead of a towel, I've used a sheet or a quilt square. Um, and I just find the towel is nice because it kind of helps, for me, it helps absorb a nice amount of the water, but how to keep it from flopping around. So um, one thing you can do is I like to make sure now I have more sticking off this end. I'll center mine so that it, it helps you see a little bit. So I'm going to center my towel on my pole and show you how to keep those edges from flopping around. So get your first lock over like this, roll this up, and then take these edges and bring them in. And I don't always do it because I'm kind of, I don't know, lazy about it or not that fussy about it. Some days I am and some days I'm not. Depends on how bulky it is. So then you roll them all in like this and then they're not flopping all around. So there you go. Hopefully that helped. Hopefully that's what you were looking for. You can also tie it off, uh, which is very traditional. What I find is when I'm doing these little short bursts of rolls, I don't feel like it. <laughs> I don't feel like tying it and untying it. You could also just rubber band these ends right now instead of tying it um, off. So that's something to consider. Rose says, I don't like rolling. I only massage and rub. Would it be faster to roll? I don't know if it's faster 
um, to roll per se, but it does, in this sense, you're making sure that you're treating it from both sides so that we're really getting the fibers to migrate together without over felting the top. It's just sort of like we're treating both sides at the same time. So Grohl, you've probably refined that technique over time, and if that works for you, absolutely go for it. You know, just notice how much time do you normally spend rubbing when you're felting something 100%, and then let's drop that down to 25% and see how do you like the results of those pre-felts. And if that's not felted enough, well, notch it up to 30, 35%, and how do you like those pre-felts? So I would say that's kind of what we're doing here in making these pre-felts, starting to gauge what you are wanting your pre-felt to do and how much do you need to roll it or felt it in order for it to perform the way you want it to perform. However you like to felt is cool with me. Linda and Faith want to know if you can use a sander on this project. Um, to make your pre-felts, I would say yes, you could use a sander, but I wouldn't use it for long. <laughs> I wouldn't, you, usually, honestly, when we see people using um, sanders, that's all they're doing anyway is forming the surface skin and then they go to rolling. I have had a number of teachers uh, in the studio here over the last couple of years, or just last year, really come in and use sanders here in the studio, and almost all of them use them only in the beginning to felt their piece, and then they roll to some degree. I have one person who uses the sander a little bit more, but most people use it just as part of the process, and so with that I would say, yeah, give it a go, but all sanders are different. How people buffer their sander in between their project is different, and again, think of how you use a sander or what's your stages of felting to get something felt at 100% and then think about dropping it down to 25% to start and then 30% and see how you like the pre-felts that you're making. Some of our felting friends want to confirm the total number of times they should be rolling uh, for both sides. Um, well, I'm just rolling from the top actually, so I'm not going to flip, I'm not even going to flip it over for these. So start with a hundred rolls from each edge and then um, go ahead and take it up maybe another 50 or 60 rolls from each edge so that you see how you like your pre-felt there. So let's see how we've done here. My back, I'm back to where I was. Okay, so all I really want is this stuff to hold together. And let's look at that overhead. Okay, cool. So now you can see these guys are starting to migrate. And if I wanted to, I could probably peel these two parts apart. But look that I'm rubbing my hand and it's not just coming away. I could felt it more. Over here, I've got these striated designs, you know, going up and down. And they're not just yielding under my touch. So I can see that I could kind of pick this up and it's somewhat of a fabric. And I'll tell you right now that for me, I'll be happy with this. I'll be happy with being able to take this piece and rinse it um, so that I can dry it and cut it for a later project. Now again, it's going to depend on how sharp you want your lines to be. So the best thing to do would be to take this piece measure the amount of, um, I mean, write down the number of times that you rolled it, and then the first time you use it, note how well you like how that's doing. I think I'm going to go ahead, so we rolled about 20 times, and I'm estimating because I cannot count. <laughs> I think that I'm going to invent a poll that counts as you roll. What do you think? Would that be good? That would be awesome. <laughs> okay, what if it's like a Fitbit? Someone's going to do this. By the time I get off, it's going to be like out of production in China. So what about like a Fitbit can tell you like how many miles you walked. If we have a, you know, the, the fun roller, you could like strap it on to whatever you're doing and it can tell you how many times you rolled. We're just going to go 30 more from each and that's going to be 150. So bring your questions. Pressure should you be applying as you roll? Just enough to roll it. Don't put any body weight on it. 
Don't put any body weight on it at all. Just this. Notice I'm sitting, and that is actually preventing me from putting body weight on it. Sitting and felting is totally new for me. I've always stood and felted, um, always, my whole tenure felting. And sitting and felting is very new. I told Anne I got this new rolly chair in my studio, and I'm just all over it. And besides, I guess I don't want to keep raising my table, mm -hmm. and so I've been, you know, keeping it down. Um, so only when I'm doing little stuff, though. But um, don't put any pressure on it any more than it takes to just get that rock and roll. So no, no body weight. New shares. I am loving this new camera angle. Oh, cool. <laughs> Thank you. I worked on this. We worked on this. Anne helped me so that we can not just have talking head and top down. So uh, hopefully it helps a little bit. Cool. Barbara asked, if you want to needle felt on your free felt, is there a minimum thickness that you would recommend? Oh, you mean you want to needle felt it as a background? If you want to needle felt it on, uh, on as a background, well, gosh, you know, I would say that you want it thick enough that it doesn't separate when you needle felt on it. So you need it to be, if I were going to needle felt onto a background, I would just felt it all the way. I wouldn't make it a pre-felt, I would make it a felt. If you want to needle felt onto a background, needle felt it all the way. There's no reason for it to be loose. Now, if you want to needle felt the pre-felt onto something else, well then the thickness will just be dictated by that design. So who asked that question? That was Barbara. Barbara, if that did not answer your question, please repost so that I make sure I answer your question. But I understood you to say, if you're going to needle felt onto your pre-felt, how thick does it need to be? So my answer is, I would rather felt it all the way if I'm trying to make a canvas, a background canvas, felt it all the way. Now we did do a video where we made canvases um, to needle felt on. And really, we just used our MC1 batting. And really, all we did was just make little felts and blend some colors together, because we were making like tiny greeting cards. And I shared some of those last week in photos where we had the big daisy needle felted on. Uh, I might have even brought in the, I brought the pieces, didn't I, last week. So you might visit that. Now, if you want to needle felt that onto something, well, that's a different, that's a different answer. And it's really going to come down to whatever you're making. We're almost done here. We're almost done with 150 rolls from each side. You might be tempted to stop at 100. You certainly can. You can roll this just 200 times and let it dry and see how it is the next day. I just really want it to hold together. So we're going to do, and I don't want the edges to smoosh out too much when I cut them and felt them into something else. And again, this is just for our surface design and controlling the shapes of those colors that we brought together. Cindy asked, can you use a, can you felt in the dryer instead of rolling? I, Cindy asked, can you felt in the dryer? Okay, so first of all, you can felt in the dryer instead of rolling. For doing a pre-felt, I personally wouldn't do it, but you could give it a go. Some people like to felt in the dryer, and what they do is, instead of rolling around a pole like this, they might roll around a short pull noodle, or I did felt in a dryer. I've, I have felt it in the dryer, but it was at the encouragement of a friend, and um, I didn't really enjoy the experience myself, but I do have friends that like to use the dryer. So I would say every dryer is different. The amount of thud you're going to get, it bounces in the dryer, and the thudding is what helps felt your piece. Some people really like to do it, and I would say take it slow, make a small piece. Don't try and make yourself a big fancy hat and then be discouraged when it doesn't really work out like you planned. If you're going to felt in the dryer, then become a student of felting in the dryer. But I don't really felt in the dryer myself. Okay, let me show you this real quick. And this is our piece, and now I just laid these big pieces down and this thins out. So remember, I'm not really trying to create a big piece of fabric per se, meaning like this is not all to be used in unison. I could cut this out as a piece. I could cut this out as a piece because I think it's interesting, a block here, a block there, a line, wherever these things come together. But this is all I'm trying to do is to get something that is basically, it's delicate, but look, it's holding together and not falling apart under my touch. And that's kind of what I'm wanting. The designs, uh, this is starting to pucker just a tiny bit, but 
uh, there's still enough in here, meaning there's enough play in the fibers that if I really wanted to pull it apart, I could. Now this has been felted um, considerably compared to where it was, and what we'll do in our final project again is we'll use some of these that have been felted a little bit and some of them that have um, not been. So our next stage with this, if you are going to use it right away, like let's say within the next three to four or one to four days or five days, you could leave the soap in it. You could just lay this flat and let it dry and leave the soap in it just like it is. If you're not sure when you're going to be using it or it seems a little bit longer, go ahead and rinse the soap out and just be gentle with it. If it's very fragile, uh, your pre-felt is very fragile, well then sandwich it in your mesh so give yourself a big mesh sandwich and rinse it in your mesh. So if you feel like it's going to fall apart on you and you want it that lightly pre-felted, then by all means, sandwich it in your mesh and just run the water through your mesh. Rinse the soap out, lay it to dry. Make your notes right when you make your piece so that when you come back to it, you remember, even include, I should have included on the note card, but in the other notes, just put whether it was rinsed or whether the soap is still in so that you kind of know when you want to use it by. And I'm not saying that the soap will definitely break it down, but <clears throat> the soap can, the, you know, the soap and the, the wool fibers shouldn't be together for a long time. Well, I have to, I have to clear my throat. <coughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> okay, so I want to show you something else. But remember, now you're just going to rinse this and dry this, and I hope you'll make some <coughs> before the next time we come together <coughs> so that you can show them. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm stuffing my throat. Oh, my goodness. Okay. And we just said soap, beautiful <coughs> soap. <laughs> okay, so... This is going to be very similar. Now, the, the project I'm doing, or the one of the projects I'm working on, has a lot of blues in it. So I'm going to be making more blues, but I also have lots of other colors I love. So this is a great also time to experiment with how you like your colors coming together. And just, you know, play with that a little bit. Let me clear this off the table here. And then I just want to show you a couple of things, uh, or at least one, with a, a needle felted pre-felt. I'll put this up here. Are there any other questions we should answer before we go? Anne's got a few. Teresa asks, how do you know when your pre-felt is too felted? Well, when you go to incorporate it in your finished project and it doesn't bind, really. It's going to come down to experimentation, and that's why almost every question that y'all have asked, I said evaluate the effectiveness of your pre-felt within your project. That's really what I meant. You know, so you're going to have to just give it a go, and that's going to become one of our new, uh, our new, what do you call it, not catchphrase, catchphrases. I've decided that give it a go. So a couple of years ago, um, we had a theme for the year, and it was all about you experimenting. What was that theme? Expand, create, grow? Yeah, something like that. And so the idea was that so many times we get asked questions that honestly can only be answered by you in the moment because felting is so different depending on who's doing it. And so making pre-felts and learning to make pre-felts so that they get incorporated into whatever your project is the way you want is really going to come down to learning your fiber, learning your own techniques, you know, understanding what approach you're taking, and then also evaluating the results of that. Um, so I brought in one little guy to share. Y'all have seen Stash a hundred times or more probably, but there's a reason and it's his acorn hat. So his acorn hat was made with pre-felted MC1 batting. I made a wet felted pre-felt and then I cut out each of these little individual triangles and needle felted them right onto his head. So the hat is not removable, um, but it is made from an MC1 pre-felt. So this is an example of something that was pre-felted with the goal of making it a needle felt. So I would say, um, yeah, it's definitely a pre-felt or a very soft felt. What's the difference between those? Uh, I don't know, a pinch this way and a pinch that way, but there was plenty of feltability left that I could easily needle felt and continue to stack all of these layers, um, but it was, the fabric was made with a wet felting process. And that's the same with his, his little boots. So his little boots are also uh, made from 
a similar, just a little bit thinner wet felted fabric and slightly different colors on there, and then needle felted onto his legs. This was the boot fabric was needle felted just a little bit more because these I really knew that I needed to stack and layer those. So that's just an example for you of something made uh, with a wet felted pre felt and of a different fabric also. <clears throat> Any other final questions, Anne? One okay, time. answers. We have one more. Thank you all so much too for just hanging out with me. And I hope before even this final question, I just want to encourage you to give this a go and make your own little pre felt or many, so that uh, when you see what you can do with them, that you kind of have your self loaded and ready to go with lots of stuff to play with. Okay, what's our question? Ka uh, Karen wants to know for the Wooly Wednesdays coming up, or, or that we're making pre felts for, mm -hmm. how many of these pre felts should we have prepared? Oh, okay, that's a good idea. So um, I would at least, based on these, for, for what we're doing, we're going to be making a, you know a fairly small project, and I would say it, it's going to be subjective depending on your design, but our base fabric that we're going to end up creating is just about this size. So you'll want to make a few pre-felts if you want. You don't even have to do pre-felts for the project I'll show you. You could just 100% wet felt it or do the artful wet felt fabric when we get to that point. Anybody can participate when we get to that point. But we're going to be making something, a fabric that is about this big, maybe a little bit bigger. You might decide to make yours bigger, like the size of a sheet of notebook paper. You might decide to make yours a little bit smaller than mine. So think of uh, the end end result fabric is at least going to be the size of a sheet of notebook paper, maybe a little bit bigger and I'm going to be cutting my pre-felts into kind of smaller patchwork pieces and that's why I want to make several so that I really have something to pull from when I get to that point. Good question. Anything else before we go? Y'all have just been great. Thank you so much for playing with me. I hope that you'll make your pre felt So remember, um, two layers of fiber and designs if you want. We're doing the crisscross and um, you're going to roll a hundred times from each edge and then go ahead and roll 50 more times from each edge. Make your little note cards and just give us a few minutes. We will get the um, document uploaded to the website at least by tomorrow morning and we'll post a link here under the descriptions. If your question didn't get answered today, make sure you leave a comment down below and if you had fun, maybe consider giving the video a like. We hope that you'll subscribe and let us know what was your favorite takeaway down below. All week long you can hang out with us on Facebook in our group, uh, Living Felt Friends. You can tag us on Instagram if you decide to make this and I hope you will and all the supplies that we use are available on our site and we will have there is a link to those at least to the the pre felt that we referenced and we'll link to these other fabulous packs that the girls showed you so Anne has got you have uh, a prize bucket so Anne's going to come in we're going to draw prizes for everyone who's participated during the live show today what are we giving away Anne I'll hold the names you show the prizes fabulous <laughs> we're giving away one of our specialty designer packs mm -hmm. this is the blue delight one that I showed earlier in the Woo. broadcast and this one right here is our apple orchard just another uh, example of one of these fun color palettes yeah there's so many I don't know how many we have nine or nine nine so we have nine different specialty designer packs you can pick from and we're gonna draw a couple of names right now no peeking <laughs> Alrighty. no peeking mm -hmm. you got one okay I got one <laughs> okay I'm gonna grab one too I'm gonna do oh this basket's full it is <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's like loaded in there with names okay I have one you have one Alrighty. You go first. Okie dokie. First winner is Susan Pruitt. Oh, so fun. Susan Pruitt and Angie Brow. Yay. Thank you gals so much. Congratulations and thank you for playing with us. We hope that you will join us next time. We will be back next week. And again, if your question didn't get answered, just leave a comment down below. And thank you so much for playing with us, y'all. We appreciate it. Bye.